Okay, let, let's uh, get started now. We have uh, Jim Huguenin from Microsoft here. His uh, talk will be on Iron Python, The Road Ahead, and assisting him will be Dino over there. So, Jim, <laughs> all yours. Hi, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, microphones at this conference have been lots of fun. Um, <laughs> So I want to talk to you a little bit about Iron Python. First, um, I wanted to let you know who the Iron Python team is, and this is who does the actual work. Um, so these are the people who work on Iron Python, the core team for Microsoft full time. Um, Dino Veland, who you'll meet um, a little bit later, so I won't say any more about him now. Uh, Dave Fugate has been involved in Python for a very long time, and I hope is out in the audience there somewhere. Uh, Srivatsan. Um, and Harry Pearson, who's back there, although Harry tells me he doesn't actually work on this for another two weeks, so I should have cut him off the slide. Uh, other people who work on Iron Python, insert your name here if you want to help. We have lots of people who are helping out in the community. We also have you know, the options if you want to really commit and help us working directly at Microsoft. Um, we'd love to talk to you. Okay, so what is Iron Python? Iron Python, it's a you know, it's always been two things: a great implementation of this Python programming language that we all know and love. Um, with the benefits of .NET. Uh, the benefits of .NET you know, include things like infrastructure pieces like GCs and JITs that we can take advantage of. They include large frameworks that we can take advantage of, so there's existing libraries. Um, and they include different places that you can run .NET sometimes that you might not be able to run Python. And I'll talk about some of the advantages of .NET as I go through the talk. Iron Python's always been this interesting balancing act. And <coughs> When I was trying to think about this balance, uh, I, I, was, I was in um, Microsoft Research Cambridge, visiting them there and talking about their language researchers. So they're very into static languages, and they were talking about all the benefits of these highly typed static languages. And you know what? I actually loved their talks. There's a certain part of me that that just deeply appeals to. But <laughs> um, I felt they were kind of missing the point of programming languages as you know, being about people talking to computers and you know, easily communicating with them. So I kind of appreciated both worlds. And as I was flying back from Cambridge, they had these ads up in the London Heathrow Airport. Uh, and I was kind of very tired at the time and jet lagged, so maybe they sunk into my brain more than they should have. Uh, the point of these ads was this company was trying to say, you know, different people have different points of view. Some people look at a computer and say, that's work. Look at a child and say, that's play. Other people look at a computer and say, oh, that's play. Look at a child and say, that's work. And every time I saw one of these different ads up there, my mind immediately said both. Um, you know, for me, computers are both work and play. Children are both play and work. Um, uh, and anybody who has kids, I think, would probably agree with that. And so what I liked about this was this captured this notion of both, and that there's these different points of view, and that if you can see from both points of view, you can get a lot of power, I think, is a lot of fun. Um, I certainly feel this all the time, you know, being somebody who works for Microsoft on open source software. Um, I sometimes feel like you know, I need to see two different points of view at the same time. Or somebody who likes to be friends with Anders Halesberg, who works on C Sharp and loves static typing, and also friends with Guido, who works on Python and loves dynamic typing, sometimes I feel like it's both. You know, it's not, I don't want to pick one or the other. And that's kind of the point of Iron Python, is you shouldn't have to pick. So where are we going with Iron Python? Uh, I actually, this could be a very short talk, because um, uh, where we're we going? Well, better Python implementation, more benefits from .NET. That's the road ahead. Um, yeah, OK. So I thought a long time about what I wanted to demo at this conference. Um, I've given, this is going to be the fourth year that I've talked about Iron Python at a Python conference. Um, first year, uh, I demoed Merlin. Uh, I don't think anybody here is going to shout and ask me to bring Merlin back. Um, but it did occur to me briefly. Um, I, I've always been a big fan of Merlin. Uh, there's cool graphics technologies inside of .NET. There's WPF. This is um, one of my favorite WPF applications. It's the New York Times reader that runs on top of Windows Vista. Um, and it gives you just a beautiful layout so that you still have that lovely newspaper layout that people like and the New York Times thinks is important to their brand, you know, using this graphical library that .NET has, which works great from Python. WPF is cool. Speech. Um, no pictures to go with this one um, because it's speech. Um, I could do that, although having seen a lot of people try to demonstrate speech recognizers on stage, uh, I'm just not that brave. Um, I could de demonstrate XNA, which is Microsoft's new game framework. I showed you that last time, and, and XNA is a lot of fun, and being able to script these things and write games in Python is fun. 
Uh, I can do robots. This is actually the last public demo I gave of Iron Python. I realized, for those of you who saw my demo last year, many of you probably didn't see the robot that's down there, that's the little Lego NXT robot. So recently when I've been doing the demo, I build a balloon construction on top of it so people can see the balloon doggy moving around. Um, and that's a lot of fun, but you know, flying to Chicago and bringing a robot around in this day and age of um, the TSA is just not that much fun. Now, I could go the other direction and you know, show you the Python regression test suite because you know, that's part of being true Python. And you know, we, we could run through the Python regression test suite and talk about what it means to be really Python. Um, that would be very useful, but um, not that fun. It's a lot of enterprisey stuff. Uh, I need to thank the person who gave the Python.net talk for this lovely phrase. Uh, like ASP.net, Microsoft uh, Exchange Server, SQL Server, Windows Server. These things are all really useful stuff, and I think this is actually one of the sweet spots of if you're working with any of these products, Iron Python's a great opportunity for you. Um, but was it possible to come up with a demo that was both fun and useful? Uh, so that was the challenge, and we'll see if I've succeeded. Uh, it actually wasn't possible for me to do all by myself. Um, so I asked Dino to help me put together a demo. Now, Dino is the lead developer working on Iron Python. Uh, you can go ahead and switch over to Dino's laptop, because I'm sure that'll take a little while. Switch over to this side. Um, I'm going to hold the mic for you so you can talk. Uh, uh, here we go. The, the dual stage. So Dino's the lead developer on Iron Python. He's the one who, you know, most of the cases where when people want something new in Iron Python, if you can get Dino really excited about it, it'll happen a lot faster than if you get anybody else excited about it. So, and Dino is going to do this demo, and I will try and hold the mic so he can talk into it. We'll see what happens. All right, so what I'm going to show you today is Iron Python 2.0 Beta 1, which we just released on Friday. And I'm going to start off by showing you uh, Django running on Iron Python. So, the first thing that I need to do, of course, is to install Django. And let's make sure you can see that. Um, so, we have setup. I'm going to tell it to install. And I don't want it to compile because we don't have PYCs. So, there's no reason to compile. Okay, so you know, Dino's using Iron Python here to actually launch the Django setup tool. Um, and to, geez, that's a lot of files it's installing. Yep, so that all just got installed into my Iron Python directory. And so I can drill down into lib. We can see site packages. And there's your normal Django install. Nothing special about that. Um, so at this point, I have a little site. And this is just the normal Django tutorial that you create when you go through uh, the Django website. It's up there. It's pretty easy. It's just a little voting uh, booth app. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead, and I'm actually going to start up the server. Um, so one thing you might be wondering Kay. is, is this really Django? Um, do we have to change anything? And so you might notice that I have Microsoft SQL Server running in the background, and Django doesn't support that out of the box. So obviously, we had to change something. So what do we have to change? Well, luckily, all these files are identical that you're seeing here. Um, but those are the actual change files. So over here, I have a database provider for Microsoft SQL Server Express Edition. And that's just the free edition of SQL Server you can download and use on your machine or your, wherever you want. Um, and so in order to use this, I just have to use our normal .NET interop story. So I import CLR. I add a reference to system.data, which is the uh, um, ADO.NET uh, stack. And then I can just import the classes that I need. And on top of that, I can build the normal Python database APIs that Django is going to talk to. So this is one of the cool things of running on top of Iron Python. And I get a little bit of that enterprise-y stuff in, right? This is if you're running on top of Iron Python, you get to use these nice APIs to get it SQL Server. So along the lines of SQL Server, I need a couple of other tweaks in Django. Uh, one of them here is I needed to drop this limit one because uh, SQL Server doesn't support that syntax. Luckily, Django already has an API for dealing with uh, doing this limit syntax against uh, in a database agnostic way. And so I just called their pre-existing function. Um, another change I needed to make was actually matching a behavior that's already present for MySQL but hasn't been abstracted away. So here, I just needed to also check for uh, the MS SQL provider. And if that's what we're running against, then I can't send microseconds back to the database because it'll blow up. There's actually one spot where uh, MySQL apparently can handle it, and MS SQL can't. So we have that little update, and then the same thing down here. So, so these are all the updates to make Django work with Microsoft SQL, but these have nothing to do with running on Iron Python. Right. 
Um, the, the other interesting thing to note here, this really reminds me of our experience when we started to get Iron Python running with the CPython regression test suites. We'd often go in, and when we found there was a regression test that we were having problems with, there'd be a guard in there saying, if um, version of Python is Jython, don't run this test or do something slightly different. And we found that that was exactly the same thing. And we're finding similar cases. Pretty much anywhere somebody puts a guard in saying, if there's some particular variant, do something special. Uh, you know, it's usually nice if they can generalize it better than that. So unfortunately, there was one change that I actually had to make to make Iron Python run. And um, this change uh, deals with the Unicode strings. You may have heard Guido mention it during the keynote. Him and Jim were talking. And Iron Python only has Unicode strings. So when we read in something like a JPEG from disk, uh, we read it in as a Unicode string. And what's going to happen in Django is they're actually going to encode it on the wire before it goes out to the web server. So this isn't a good thing, because we're going to corrupt our JPEGs before we send them out. Um, so I just needed to look at the MIME type. If it was text, then I needed to uh, still do the encoding. And if it's not text, then I need to skip it. Um, I've heard around uh, while I'm here that maybe the latest version of Django might not need this tweak because it's more Unicode aware. So um, that's great. Maybe we won't need this in the future. Um, this is just Django uh, 0.96. It's the version you download off of the website. So it's not the latest and greatest, unfortunately. So those were all the changes that were necessary. So let's go ahead and actually take a look at the app that's running. Um, so, you know. This is sort of amazing. I, I want to, you saw a whole bunch of files that were changed there, and I just want to make clear that it's true that only one of those files needed to be changed to make Django work with Iron Python, and that was to work with the known issue we have around binary, fi binary data stored in Unicode strings doesn't work particularly well. Um, and it's something that we know the Django folks are working on. The rest is just to work with Microsoft SQL. Um, Django ships with a bunch of databases in the box. Um, some of us kind of wish it included Microsoft SQL, but maybe we have something else we need to do to make that happen. So I've brought up the admin tool, and uh, I'm just going to add a question to the poll. Um, and again, this is just the normal Django app here. So uh, how about I ask what your favorite bird is? Um, and the one tweak I did have to, uh, the one addition I've made to this is I have this little image field. So I can uh, put in some rich graphics here. And I don't know, what are some birds? Uh, we got heron. Uh, we got cardinals and uh, penguins, maybe? I don't know. Wait a second, there better not be too many votes for Penguin, or we're going to be in trouble. <laughs> I don't think Steve Ballmer's watching, luckily. Oh, okay. So who here wants to vote for Penguin? <laughs> okay, everyone loves Penguins. Okay, so I already had some questions in there. And so let's, you know, we have SQL Server, and so, you know, we can also use this, uh, this nice, slick UI over here. And so I can come over here, and I can show you the questions. And yeah, there they are. Voila. So, so you had to see one of these Microsoft GUI style things to know it really was a Microsoft app on the back end. So there's the app. It's running. Um, I can drill into the questions, right? And um, I can vote. Uh, Tamarin. Ooh. <laughs> Voila. So this is just, you know, as I mentioned before, this is just the normal voting app. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at that. Um, so here's the app. Um, and Django, of course, comes with its models. Um, so it's got the poll model um, and the choice. And this is what's stored in our database. I've added the image field in here. Um, and of course, it's got its views. And so these are just mapping on what we just saw. Um, so that's, that's pretty neat. Um, but what I really wanted to do was kind of take this to the next level you make a rich internet application of some form, you know, that was using uh, Ajax and all of that stuff. But, uh, you know, I don't really like JavaScript, so uh, I wasn't too inclined to use it. Um, luckily, uh, you know, it does, whoops, it does support uh, sending JSON over the wire using its own built-in serializer and, and Django, and that is very easy to get going. I can also do things like this, and I am sending this over as text slash JavaScript, uh, you know, that's... Unfortunately, I have to use it that little bit, but uh, I won't use it much more than that. This was actually really cool for me to see, and I, I wasn't that familiar with Django, but you know, that's the amount of code that it's required to turn Django into providing a web service that people can talk to um, over, over a JSON API easily. There's nothing Iron Python about this. This was just sort of, I thought this was a really cool way of providing a web service API. Okay, so we've got that side done. 
And now I need to write some client UI that I'm going to, you know, actually talk to and consume the JSON. And, you know, I'd really love to do that in Python. And there's actually a way for me to do that in Python using Silverlight. So that's what I actually did. So I built a little app uh, using Silverlight. And this is what that app looks like. Um, you can see I import a ton of stuff from the Silverlight libraries for my UI. Um, and then I have this code here to actually consume the JSON, send votes back, and all that good stuff. Show, show that little bit in the middle. There's this amazing thing. Those of you who know JSON know that the, the cheap and dirty way of, of understanding JSON in JavaScript is to avow it. Um, the funny thing that I don't think many people know is it turns out JSON is also legal Python code. Um, to eval. So you can do the same cheap and dirty trick to evaluate it for a demo. This is not how I'd recommend doing JSON in your real application, but it's a lovely cheap and dirty trick. So that was nice and easy. Um, and uh, I don't know if all JSON's valid Python code, but in this case it just turns into dictionaries and lists, and that's awesome. So I've got my app over here. Um, let's go ahead and take a look at what that looks like. So here's the voting booth app. You can see I've got some nice, rich video here in the background. Um, I've got some nice animations on my questions. You know, this stuff kind of fades in and fades out. I can bounce around, and it slides around, and it looks all pretty and beautiful. Okay, so let's, let's, take, let's take a quick vote here. So, so favorite bear. Who votes for Yogi? Teddy? Mike Ditka? Of course. We're in Chicago. <laughs> So I can vote, and the results pop up, and more rich UI, and it's beautiful. So anybody who didn't vote for Mike Ditka better be sure to get out of here before Sunday night, because you're in Chicago. Um. So I can move on to my next question, favorite tier. I wonder what that could be about. Oh. <laughs> Let's try that one more time. Web developers! Web developers! Web developers! Okay, so, so at this point, anybody brave enough to vote for anything other than the web for your favorite tier? <laughs> I'm not. Click on web, quick. I want to see the results first. Well, web is already winning pretty heavily, so yeah, yeah, follow the crowd anyway. So moving on to the next question. Obviously, this next question has nothing to do with this previous question. Um, we have Tamarin, we have Mono, we have other. Well, you know, Mono isn't really a monkey, uh, but we run there, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to vote for Mono. And Mono, by the way, just to, so you're seeing Silverlight here running in the browser, and it's running on Windows. Microsoft also ships the version that runs on Macintosh, but the Mono group builds Moonlight, which is the version of Silverlight that lets this same browser stuff that you're seeing here run on Linux. So that makes it particularly my favorite, at least my favorite way of spelling monkey. So one final question. Um, I'll use this to kind of talk about the UI here. Um, so you can see I've got a bunch of nice effects here. And those are actually really, really easy to do with Silverlight. Um, I'm just a, a developer. I have no design experience. And somehow I managed to put this thing together. And it actually looks halfway decent. So I was pretty happy about that. Um, and let's take a look at how that happens. Um, so Animation in Silverlight is done through the storyboard class. And what this class lets you do is it lets you have a timeline where various animations are going to happen. Um, and so for this, um, I create a storyboard. And I'm going to have that last for one third of a second. And I'm just going to add a couple of transforms into it. Um, I have two pieces of text. One's the foreground, one's the background, white text, black, black text. And I just want to make the font get bigger. So I resize it to a a font of size 40. And I just kick that off, and it just happens behind uh, the scenes. I don't have to do anything other than that. And then when the mouse leaves, same thing. I can just resize it back down to a size 30 font, and it just goes back, and it just gives me these slick, beautiful animations and a very small amount of code, and it's just, it's just great. You know, even I can make a beautiful app. <laughs> OK. Thanks, Nino. Thanks very much. Can we get back over to this one? Great. OK, so you know, Silverlight, so actually, I need to step back for a second, because there were two things that we just showed you. And both of them are about what we're doing with Iron Python and are about where we're heading. Right? One of them is we showed you Django running on top of Iron Python. That, so how many here were, were excited to see Django running on Iron Python? Yeah. That, for us, is a measure of, look, we really want to be Python. We don't want to just say, you know, 
Uh, something that I think I heard before, which you know, use our new APIs instead of using all the old Python APIs that you're used to. You know, that's something that would make our life a lot easier if everybody wanted to do that, but it would take away so much of the value of being Python. So a lot of our work's going into making all those existing APIs work so that things like Django that have things like really cool web service APIs that you know, I hadn't seen before are available to you. The other thing we showed you was the other end of it, letting you run code inside the browser. And that was using Microsoft's new APIs because it's an area that Python hasn't ever been before. How many were excited to see Python running in standard browser? Yeah, that, that's the one that um, gets me the most excited because it's something that I couldn't do before. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but you know, I, I've, the idea of bringing Python out of the server and into the web browser. I, I've talked with so many people actually at this conference who are doing crazy things where they're trying to get you know, interesting Python apps to do Ajax kind of stuff. And they're looking at you know, translating Python to JavaScript, and you know, that's never going to work particularly well. Or they're looking at you know, trying to write a JavaScript library so that JavaScript sucks a little bit less so their brain doesn't you know, blow up so badly when they have to write JavaScript code. It's just a painful process. We all have a great programming language. Why shouldn't we able be able to use it inside the browser? Um, Silverlight um, runs on the three major browser platforms. It runs on IE, it runs on Firefox, it runs in Safari. Um, Michael Ford demonstrated um, Silverlight yesterday, and he was running on a Macintosh with Safari, I believe, which is actually the first time I've seen that demo, which was cool. Um, it also runs on Macs, it runs on Windows, and thanks to the Moonlight Project, it runs on Linux. So I don't think, and anybody here running uh, an operating system slash browser that doesn't fit into this matrix? Yeah, okay, I, I'm sure they're one or two, but it's about one or two. <laughs> um. <laughs> ah, we could talk about cell phones. The other big announcement is, um, so Silverlight's also coming to the Nokia platform as well as the Windows mobile platform. So. Um, if there were other platforms that were open to letting developers write whatever kind of code they wanted to on it, rather than locking down the platform completely, um, we'd love to run there too. Oh, it's so nice to get to pick on somebody else for not being open. <laughs> um, that, that just doesn't happen nearly as much as I want to. And yeah, I, I could actually probably show, the, show the, this device that Brett was nice enough to loan me to use as a timer. Um, it's not actually what I'm talking about, but it looks the same. Um, uh, so if you're excited about using Silverlight, if you're excited about using Django, you know, get Iron Python, get Django, and you know, give us bug reports because we're sure this is the this is the very first time we've ever shown Django running on Iron Python. We've got more work to do. Dino is going to hopefully going to be working with some folks during the sprint time too. He's going to be around here for that to try and make that work better. If you're interested in the Silverlight side, this is the website to go to. Um, it's dynamicsilverlight.net. This will get you everything you need to do to get started using Python in your browser. The other interesting point you should notice here, and we go back and forth on the team, and you can guess that it wasn't me or Dino who put this website together, but one of the other members of our team because of the ordering. Um, <laughs> uh, it, it, it always depends, but Ruby and Python or Python and Ruby in the browser, um, it, it goes back and forth. Um, I do want to briefly talk about that part of Microsoft stuff and the dynamic language runtime and supporting multiple languages um, in the browser. Uh, because, you know, a lot of us would just like to say, well, all you need is Iron Python. It's the one dynamic language that matters. The problem is, you know, every time somebody says that, sometimes they say, all you need is JavaScript or all you need is Perl. Um, and they're usually wrong. <laughs> so while I think Python is all that I ever need, I really want to see as many of these languages running as possible. So the dynamic language runtimes, just to take what we've learned from Iron Python and put better support into the core common language runtime platform so people can build dynamic languages better. The value of this, right, is you reduce the engineering drudgery. You make it easier to get a language working. I'm sure the Jython guys would love it if somebody would reduce the engineering drudgery. Um, I think they've got efforts to do that. Um, it encourages sharing when possible. If you have a shared platform, people share more code with each other. Makes it easier for languages to call back and forth. I'll get to that quickly. Um, and you can focus on what's unique to you, right? You shouldn't be, if, if you're building, uh, if you're building a Python implementation, in my mind, building a garbage collector is a complete waste of time because lots of people have garbage collectors. Building a really interesting meta class, you know, meta object protocol, um, because that's something that's you know sort of new that Python can provide. You want to work on the things that are new that your language has that nobody else does. So that's why we're doing it. Um, the other explanation for why we're doing a dynamic language runtime, I said before, right? We had Python, and people kept asking us for more languages. Right? This is the full set of languages I think we've been asked for um, to provide dynamic support. Um, and 
I don't know, this is a famous statement in computer science. Computer scientists only believe there are three numbers in the world. Um, I don't know if any of you have heard this before. The three numbers are zero, one, and infinity. Um, so you start off with, you know, we don't need to do this, or we're going to do this for a special case, or we better do this for everybody. Uh, and the dynamic language runtime is kind of this result of, you know, we know that zero languages isn't the right idea. One language has always been a disaster anytime somebody's done it. Um, the one true language doesn't work, so we may as well support as many as we possibly can. Uh, and this is kind of the motto of the dynamic language runtime, is sharing is good. But I don't want to spend much time on the dynamic language runtime here because, you know, this is the Python conference, and this is just engineering benefit for you. This just means it's going to be easier for Python to work well on .NET. Uh, I did want to note this whole notion of multiple, uh, you know, supporting multiple languages on runtimes. Uh, it's one that I, I remember t giving the same story about why multiple languages on runtime was great about 12 years ago, um, if I'm right, at a Python conference, maybe 11 years ago, uh, about Jython, about this thing here and why it was so important for the JVM to support multiple languages. At the time, I lost out to the Java zealots who believed there was one true language and everybody should program in Java, and therefore something like Jython wasn't interesting. Uh, I kind of want to congratulate Frank and the rest of the Jython community for bringing Jython back, because um, I think that's really, you know, that's awesome to see, and I love seeing these other implementations of Python out there, and so seeing more platforms supporting Python is a fantastic thing. It's wonderful to see Sun finally turning around and realizing the light that maybe their language is other than um, Java or possibly other than Ruby out there too, so congrats. Um, The crazier version of this, and I picked a logo to make sure you knew it was the crazier version, is this thing called Iron Monkey um, that Mark Hammond mentioned earlier today. Um, this is not, in fact, their logo. Um, Iron Monkey is the project to get Iron Python and Iron Ruby running on Tamarin. Uh, as far as I know, Brendan isn't picking just Python. He's trying to pick Python and Ruby. I, it would be kind of cool if he was picking just Python and said this is the only community we care about. Um, uh, Tamarin becomes, you know, wanting it to become multilingual. So here they're taking the JavaScript VM and making it a multilingual VM. Uh, the other thing that I like about Brendan's quote here is that he gives credit to the Microsoft public licensed open source that Microsoft's given to the world for making this easier. Now I have no idea if technically Iron Python running on Tamarin is going to work well at all. Um, but I think it's a fascinating project and I think it is a cool thing about the open source world that something this crazy can be tried and if it turns out to work well, that'll be awesome. Um, which brings me to open source. Um, I have the official OSI open source logo. This is the first time I've ever put this logo in one of my slides. Um, because this year, uh, Microsoft's public license, which Iron Python's released under, became OSI approved. Um, I got to ask a poll here again. Who here cares that our license is OSI approved? Okay. So we've been saying for a long time that Python was effectively open source, sort of open source, um, lots of good things like that. Just trust Microsoft's lawyers. Um, <laughs> and that actually worked for a surprisingly large amount of people. Um, I, I guess I should thank you because I think a lot of those people were trusting me. Um, I really appreciate not having to say trust me, but trust the OSI. <laughs> um, we really are open source. It's a much easier thing to say. Um, the people who've done that actually aren't the Iron Python team. It's Microsoft has an open source team um, that's really got their act together in the past couple of years. For a long time, Microsoft didn't open, understand open source, but the open source team does, and this team within the company is the one that got the licenses OSI approved, and we work closely with them. I also promised them I'd give them a plug for their latest ad campaign. They, they're part of why they help provide the funds for this conference as a sponsor, so this is their open source heroes um, ad campaign. Uh, you can learn about all sorts of interesting open source heroes, at least according to their definition here, um, at this website. What? No. <laughs> um, moving right along. Um, the hardest part about doing that for them actually was they asked me who my favorite superhero was and I couldn't come up with anything. so. In dire straits, I came up with the brain from Pinky and the Brain, who's always set on world domination, which I'm not sure sends the right message, but um, maybe it sends exactly the right message. Uh, so speaking of world domination, um, it's not really possible to do that all by yourself. I, I showed you the Iron Python team. Um, it's five people working full-time on Python. Well, four, um, and, you know, 
an open slot um, working full-time on, on Python at Microsoft. And that's great, but that's not nearly enough um, to do everything that we need to. The community is doing some really cool stuff outside of Microsoft as well. Uh, and I just quickly wanted to point to some of these, um, including the FePy project, which has been on for a while. The FePy project, if you look at it, um, a lot of its point is to fix the modules that we didn't provide and give better Linux support. So that's a great one run by SEO. Iron Python Cookbook gives a lot of standard recipes that Michael Ford um, leads. Uh, there's a CLR wrapper project with Kurt Hagenlocker that's going to fix one of the things that we aren't doing well of making it easy to call Python from C Sharp. Ironclad's the one I want to mention briefly. Did I get the right name here for the lead guy on this? Yeah, okay. The lead guy on this is William Reed. All of these things are community projects, so I'm trying to give credit to a person. So can, I can at least put more people's names up here, but the problem with community projects are you then leave out all the other people who are helping. Um, uh, this is a project to let you import native C modules into Iron Python. Um, they currently have something that lets you take the bzip module uh, and use that from Iron Python, and they're working on making others available. And this will really fill a hole that we currently have. So I you know, wish the community tremendous luck on this, because the more C py Python modules we can bring in, the fewer that people need to translate to .NET to just be able to get their existing code running. So that's a really cool community project. Just started, so we'll see what that turns into. Um, <clears throat> let's see, Iron Python 2.0. So this is where we are in our release process. Uh, Iron Python 2.0, the big engineering work for that's all running on top of the DLR. Again, I don't think any of you particularly care about that. That's an engineering trick. Uh, the fact that it has Python 2.5 support, I think, is the interesting feature. The previous versions have all been 2.4. Uh, we shipped beta 1 on Friday. Dino demoed beta 1 for you earlier today. Uh, we plan on releasing the final before the end of this year. I'm actually a little excited with the race between Python 2.6 and 3.0. If we manage to release just before them, there'll be a short window where we're, we're, ver we're at version parity with CPython. Um, it's, you know, it's impossible to always stay at parity because we need to wait until the Python thing solidifies until we match up. But we always want to stay within sort of shouting distance so that occasionally we can hit parity. Um, let's see. Ah, yes. So the last demos that I want to do, and I'm going to, I think, need to ask Dino to come back up and give me the service that I gave him. Um, this lack of wireless microphone is fun. Uh, I want to show you just a little bit more of Silverlight um, before I'm done. Let's see. Alt tab. Uh. Here we go. So this is just a little bit more about using Python in the browser um, with Silverlight. This is, uh, you know, again, standard web page running off of my local host. Um, here's a classic Silverlight example. This is called the piano example. Um, Pretty, right? You know, this, this was built by a designer. Okay, you got the idea. <laughs> I, I can do this, actually, for a little bit. Um, um, let's see. So the code for that is very small code. A lot of that's all graphical assets that people are using. And then there's a small amount of Python code that glues it all together. This is the entire piano app that you just saw. And this is just Python app to add event handlers for when you click on the different keys. Um, and it's using the cases of you know, iterating over, not, not having, you know, handle, the way this would often be done in Flash is handle C key, handle D key, handle, and of course, you know, we know that's not how you write good code. So in Python, you know, we're using closures and all those sorts of good things to make it easy to write an event handler for all of the things the piano can do. Um, so that's the classic, you know, high-touch multimedia app that you get in Silverlight. This is the exact opposite. This was written by the um, dev manager for our team. Uh, and this, you know, lets you work with fractions. And here it's the um, evaluation code that's written in Python. Um, but the formatting engine is just HTML. So this is standard, um, this is replacing the JavaScript that you have and the JavaScript that you'd have in an Ajax app with Python code instead. Um, so you're able to do interesting things and actually, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the app and, you know, how well, uh, how responsive it is and how quickly it'll let you do, you know, fun things, five-sixths. So let's go back and look at the code for Fractulator quickly. Uh, actually, I'm going to show you the, the actual code here because I want to make a little change so you can see what's involved in making an update. So this is the code um, to do all of that. Now, the interesting things are, you know, it wants to use Python as a computation engine, so it defines a fraction class. 
And it overloads the various operators on the fraction class, just like you would if you were using Python. So it's able to have this fairly complicated application built in Python. And then for generating its UI, it's using the standard sorts of tricks you would if you were using Ajax of just spitting out some HTML and spitting it out as a string. Uh, I'm going to just stick in here um, PyCon in the results. Save this. Go back to the page. Well, oh. Um, refresh and type something, and now I have PyCon in there. Uh, let me get rid of it, actually, to, to do that just a little bit more conclusively. So I edit the Python code. I refresh the page. Um, I edit the Python code. I refresh the page, and um, my computer freaks out for some reason. Um, uh, so that was a cache miss. Um, <laughs> and you know, now I've got the new version of the Python code up and running. So it makes it very easy to work on these web apps from, from the Python code, right? There, there's no deployment step, and I'm writing Python code, and it's running in the browser against the HTML. The last application that I want to show you here is called DLR Console. Um, uh, who's timing? How much time do I have left? <laughs> Seven minutes. OK. So let's push through this really quickly. This is my last demo. This was the first Silverlight application that I wrote. This, for me, is one of those applications that I wrote in this. I was, I was sick and out of work for a week. Um, so I, you know, I was at home with my computer. And it's amazing sometimes how much hacking you can do in a week if you don't have to go into the office and go to meetings. Um, and this was the first time Silverlight was still a pre-release. And it was really hard to work with. Um, it didn't come with any of the standard features that you'd expect. So to write an application that worked on Silverlight, you needed to build you know, your own things like stack panels, uh, scroll bars. Uh, text inputs that handled key presses and figured out how to map from key numbers to actual sensible things. So this was the very first version of Silverlight. It's not nearly that hard anymore. But I was able to write all of that in Python. Um, and that, you know, for me, made it actually kind of fun um, rather than a challenge. So I had a nice UI framework underneath, but I could write a bunch of code in Python. Uh, and what was I able to build out of that? Well, it was this little application um, that runs, and it gives you a Python editing environment. Uh, inside the browser, and now I'm going to need somebody to hold this for me. Um, so here I have this, and I can type the sort of simple things that you'd expect to see. Sorry. Um, I can take a whole bunch of Python code, and I can just execute it. So interesting thing going on here. This is the ultimate meta application, right? This is written in Python, providing you an editor environment that runs in Silverlight inside of the browser that lets you write Python code. Uh, another cool thing, of course, is I can import standard Python libraries if I made them available. So I can import this, by far my favorite standard Python library. Um, uh, I can import calendar. And this I just quickly want to show you. I could call calendar from Python. Um, but an interesting thing is this Python library that provides some interesting calendar functions, I can call it from other languages, such as JavaScript that's running again in the same environment. Um, Calendar.printCalendar for 2008. There we go. Now I'm able to use that Python function from JavaScript and print the calendar. So that, that seems like a really cool thing to be able to do. This, this gives the JavaScript folks all of our nice Python libraries. Um, back to Python. And I'm going to do my very quick version to wrap up. But this is the one thing that I have to show you. Um, so you're running in a sandbox here. So you can't use things like open. Open's not going to work. Open, we, we actually don't make open available. This is the standard Python error. There's an error in printing it here. Trust me, it's a name error. Um, sorry, I feel like I need to prove this one. OK, anybody who was worried about that last error, it really is Python's errors. Um, so I'm in a sandbox, so I can't do things like open. But I still want to be able to open files. So I'm going to create a little open file dialog. And pop it up. So this, this I am allowed to do, because now it's in the user's control. And the user can decide whether or not they want to make files available to me while I'm running in the sandbox inside the browser. I'm going to go here to videos and get a video from our most recent web conference. Um, so now I've opened that up. And I can create a stream that points to, let's see, the selected file. Uh, and I'm going to open it for reading. So I have a stream that will read that file on my local disk. And this is what the open file dog makes available in the sandbox. I can get streams to the files that the user gives me permission to get access to. 
Now, I need to create one other thing here. I'm going to create a media element that lets me show you that, um, show you that video and add it to the canvas. Okay, let's see. I'm going to make it a little bit bigger so you can see it. Yes, my time's up. I get it. Um, <laughs> and let's see. Let's set the source uh, to be this little stream that I have here from my local hard disk. Okay, and it should start playing. Okay, I, I got it from here, Dino. Um, so who here knows who the chief software architect of Microsoft Corporation is? Do you know who it used to be a year ago? Bill Gates. So this is a little video from the guy who just replaced Bill Gates um, as the chief software architect for Microsoft um, at our latest web conference. Let's see. I want to start it from the beginning. Yell at me whether or not um, you can or can't hear it when I start it playing. Okay. Up, oh, back down. Sorry. Um, I hope most of you. Did, did I kill something? Um, <laughs> I hope most of you heard that. I, I'm sorry that the audio didn't work so well. This this was really fun for me, and I'll repeat what Ray's comment was. It was at the end. It was we've done great things, and we've done languages, including Iron Ruby and Iron Python, which I love. Um, and having that come out of the Microsoft Chief Software Architect um, to me is really kind of an exciting place that we are now. Uh, so, and of course, part of why he loves it is, you know, the fact that it runs on .NET, but part of why he loves it is it's a really cool language with a lot of really cool things you can do on it. So I think that's a great thing. Okay, my last slide. And then questions. Oh. Come on. There we go. Um, so Iron Python, we've told you about it. The things that we're doing is we're making it a great Python implementation. We really care about that. We're working on things like making real apps like Django run on top of it and run very well. We're also trying to bring new benefits that you get from .NET. That's not just fun things like WPF and pretty UIs and XNA that lets you do games or enterprisey things. It's also things like Silverlight that lets you run where you've never been able to run before. Um, that's our homepage. That's where you can learn about Silverlight and that's where you can do if you're interested in working on Iron Python. And I think I'll take like two questions. Um, and anybody's welcome to come up and ask me more questions later afterwards, but I'm afraid I'm running yeah. out of time. Yeah, it's just lunch afterwards, so, you know, I'm sure. I'll, know. I'm, I'll be here until okay. people stop asking questions, well, or my plane leaves. Um, All right. As uh, one of the people who's trying one of the ridiculously silly implementations to get some Python elements in Flash, um, what exactly can we expect from the current 1.1 um, or 1.0? Oh, what from the Silverlight that we might expect to find in a runtime, do we have all this cool stuff, or is that still alpha, beta? Oh. What exactly is now, and what can we expect? Okay, so Silverlight, to give you the schedule, Silverlight 1.0 is now, and that doesn't include the Python programmability. Silverlight 2.0 is um, what NBC just said they're going to be streaming the Olympics on. So um, if it's not ready before the Olympics, somebody's going to be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> so... And Silverlight 2.0 is what I was, Silverlight 2.0 beta 1 was what I was just showing you today. And that's, that's the bits that all of this was running on. Hi. Uh, I've seen a lot of, um, I've advised a client to help future-proof his uh, legacy VBA code that Iron Python is his route to, the, is, is his best route for the future, for the next decade. Is that a fair statement? I think that's a lovely statement. Um, <laughs> I... 
Uh, so the question was, you know, if you've got a lot of VBA code and you're thinking about moving it somewhere, what's, what's the place you should move it so you'll be future-proof for, you know, for the longest time in the future? Um, VB.net is obviously something people will tell you to move to, but I think a lot of VBA folks will really love moving to Python and, you know, find that the things that they liked about VB are still there, but the things that they didn't like so much about VB aren't there anymore. Um, I think it's a great place for those folks to go. Currently, uh, Silverlight and... Uh all of these things for the browsers are still plugins. Is there been any uh, outreach to the different uh, web browser communities to try to get this as uh, a replacement for the JavaScript engine, or they are in addition to as part of uh, natively instead of just as a plugin? So I, I guess I'll do this. You know, the question is: Is there any attempt to make Silverlight something native rather than just a plugin? Um, I think if it was possible to make it native in those three browsers that I showed you up there, you know, people would be absolutely ecstatic. Um, but there's some fairly big challenges in making it native in IE, Firefox, and Safari, and hopefully others in the future. So I actually don't think the plugin model um, is that much of a problem. And we could very well wind up being native inside of IE, but that's now back to the platform specific model, and having it as a plugin that's available everywhere for me is actually really the big win. You look at Flash, people complained about Flash being a plugin, and Flash is installed now on some huge fraction of all the computers out there. I think so long as it's a plug-in coming from a well-respected source, and I think Microsoft does, does earn that, um, uh, it's something that people are going to trust that you know, Microsoft isn't going to be trying to put viruses on their machine or do other nasty things. So I think it's a plug-in that people are going to be willing to install. And it's uh, things like, and the other side is things like the Olympics. Um, you know, each one of those events gets you another large fraction of um, installed base. What are the plans for LinQ support? For, for what? LinQ, the native language. Oh, Link support, Link. Um, so that, that was what I cut out of my talk um, <laughs> because I didn't, didn't feel like I had time to get to it and I really wanted to make sure I talked about Silverlight here and I know some people would have rather had the technical side on Link. I'm sorry. Uh, so Link, the problem with Link is it's a really, it's Link is the first feature that C Sharp has added that I've been jealous of as a Python developer. Um, in the past, they've added things like nullable support. I'm like, okay, that's because you've got such a rigid BND type system that you need to explicitly call out nullable. Um, generics are the same way. Yield, I look at it and say, great, about time. Um, so there's a lot of things that have been like that. Link is the first new feature, but it is, while it's partially a library feature, it's also a language feature. Um, so it's something that I don't believe that we can do properly without working with the core Python language team. Um, that might be an interesting thing to do. That might actually be something we might want to talk about for 3.1 that maybe we submit a pep on that. I'm not sure. Um, but it's not something that we could just do in Iron Python because it does require language changes to do right. And, you know, our principle is we don't change the language unless, we, uh, unless the language itself changes. Um, I haven't used Iron Python since you moved over to the DLR. Um, I, I found out at the BOF last night that it, it, the DLR will run on just a, a stock 2.0 framework, uh, which is what I'm using at work, which is great. Um, your demos really make me interested in trying to use this at work. Um, how many of the demos ship with Python, um, and are any of the other ones available online yet, particularly like the Django-related stuff? Um, so the Django stuff, as I just said, that's the first time that we've had Python running Django successfully. So. Dino, well, Dino is either going to blog or get somebody else to blog about the details on what was involved in doing that. That was fairly small, except for the SQL extension. So that's a small thing that we can do. Um, the, the demos that I showed you, most of those demos that I showed you, that, that page I was going to, you can get to those off of dynamicsilverlight.net. Um, most of those Silverlight demos that I showed you sh ship in that Dynamic Silverlight package, including the DLR. Well, the DLR console is also available on that website. So that website has everything except it doesn't have the, the cool stuff Dino showed at the beginning, but that's just because it just started working today. <laughs> uh, three or four days ago. <laughs> would you say that, would you say, would you say that uh, Silverlight has feature parity across all the platforms and is there kind of any kind of assurances that it will continue to always have feature parity if it does? So, so this is, do I need to repeat questions anymore? Okay. So Silverlight um, today, the, there are two platforms that are Microsoft supported. And those two um, have feature parity in Silverlight. And I, I can't see that changing. I'm not the one who can give you the assurances. But the, so the Windows and Mac version, Microsoft supports, and those are going to have feature parity. 
for the foreseeable future. The Linux version is done by the community. So that's being done, you know, the Moonlight project led by Novell. Microsoft has contributed a few things to the community, um, primarily the codecs that they need, because the codecs have some really complicated licensing um, issues around them. So the open source community has a hard time doing high quality video. So Microsoft contributing the rights to those codecs actually helps the open source community there tremendously. It's, it's a classic media problem in the open source world. Uh, the rest of that, it's, that's going to be up to the Linux community. If, you know, how, how well they support Moonlight um, is going to determine how well it works. I don't think Microsoft will do anything to hurt that, but that's going to be the community's job to make sure how good that is. I actually think that's a very good position for the Linux support to be in, because they aren't dependent on Microsoft at all for having the best support. They're dependent on themselves for how well it runs. Uh, you mentioned the CLR wrapper project. I think it's going to be a great thing to have. Can you update us more on, you know, the CLR wrapper? Yes. Um, well, so this is the last question, and it's going to have a very uh, weak answer, huh? <laughs> which is just uh, th that's, that's Kurt's project. I actually don't know. I, I would join the R and Python mailing list and ask Kurt the question on where it is right now. Um, so I, I don't know enough of the details. It's his project. Um, thank you. Thank you all.